Okay, what I wanted to um, do this time is instead of loading each notebook at a time, um, I put all the all the DBC files, all the fifteen uh, notebooks in one folder and made an archive of it, so you can just upload it once. Um, so to do this, what you want to do is, um, you know, go to, you know, just hit this GitHub button for the course. Okay, so you'll come here, which is actually just the, the GitHub. Um, then you want to, um, so you want to go to uh, uh, DBC archives, right? Yeah. So if you go to DBC archives, then it will come to this place, then go to 2017, and then you'll see this SDS 2-2.dbc. Okay, so this is uh, where you want. So Felipe, you know, you, you missed the first click. You want to go to the GitHub. And uh, so then what we want to do is write, uh, sorry, first download. This is some strange, um, so you have to download it. Um, just call it um, SDS. Well, you should just not rename it if you're doing it the first time. So just um, download it to your local laptop. And it's about five megs, so it'll take a couple seconds. So now what you have is this um, Databricks archive or DBC file. Then um, what you can do then is go to your community edition. Um, right, so then um, Well, so then you know, you remember we created the scalable data science folder, scalable minus data minus science folder in the workspace by going here and creating the folder. So now go to this folder and you want to import from file and then just choose the, the .dbc file that you just downloaded, the SDS. 2.2.dbc 1.5 MB file. Okay, so then just import. Now you have all the notebooks up to now in one place. So I'll kind of do this periodic dumps every couple of weeks just to some fixing minor things and so on. So now we have all the notebooks here. So for uh, for those who are joining now, you have everything. <laughs> I mean. You still have to go through them, right? But at least it's all conveniently placed. Mm -hmm. So what I wanted to do, so what, what we were doing last time was here. We looked at um, um, the WikiClick stream analysis. Um, and I was, so a lot of you are used to R. So I, I, I gave this little exercise. Can you do this uh, loading from the, Parquet file, remember we made a data frame and then we dumped it into the Parquet file and then we loaded that into Python, right? And created a Python data frame in PySpark. And um, I asked if, you know, if you guys can do this for R. So I've kind of completed that task. So if you go, oh, and also the, the Ivan from New Zealand, he, he helped fix this um, D3 visualization problem we had last time, which is really cool. So you can actually see a D3 output of what we were querying now. Um, so, you, you know, this SQL statement is now turned into, you know, you know, uh, into a, a, a visualizable uh, graph, okay, and the thickness tells you how many uh, visits were there from that page to that page and so on. So if you go here and let's see, show code. So the stuff Michael Armbers tweeted last year 
um, this is is kind of incompatible with the Databricks notebook, uh, something to do with anyway, something technical with HTML. So I haven't fixed it. So this is now the code. So you can see, um, you know, so it's using some force directed layouts, uh, graphs. Um, yeah, anyway, so this is just someone else's code that Michael used that is now fixed for Spark 2.2 current Databricks version. So what this allows you to do is to take a graph and just visualize it, at least if it's small enough. And that's what uh, we're doing here, okay? So this is quite nice for interactive exploration of graph value data. And you can do a lot more. So there's D3 galleries that are just, you know, the Google searches, there's a lot of code you can just um, grab and play with for a graph, interactive graph. Explorations, okay, so here is, uh, what we did last time quickly. So how to convert the raw data to Parquet and mentioned this Dremel paper and compressed columnar storage when the types are known. Um, so then we basically took this clickstream data frame and, and, and um, overrode it to uh, a different place in ABFS. Um, and then we read from that place, we read it back uh, and we could see it in Scala, all good. And then let's say, how do you do Python? So I do percent pi, and then I now have click spy. So I just read from that parquet file. This is a naive but solid way of babbling between languages. Um, and then, um, yeah, so this is um, Python. Um, so in fact, you know, the two courses, AJ's course and Amit's course are done in PySpark. So, you know. And then finally, um, I asked, how do you do this in R? So this is basically, you can do this in R like this. So percent %R, and then you call library spark R, and then you do the visual R gets operator, PF gets create data frame faithful. This is just a built-in old faithful data set, which are these uh, geysers that erupt in uh, um, Yellowstone National Park. Um, that's not good. Um, is that? <clears throat> okay, so um, now we can do, we can load our data frame we wrote. We just have to say read.df, put the file path and source is parquet, and then we have, okay. This took me like 15 minutes of Googling, okay, so you can do it a lot faster. <laughs> Right, I, um, and then, you know, once you're in R land, you can just do all sorts of, op there's a whole uh, guide on Spark R, right? But in this course, we will avoid Python and R like a disease, just because, uh, you know, it, but, you know, we will use it, right? Like to maybe do visualization and things like this, but the core things we will learn in, in Scala, because the idea is that, um, you know, you, you need to be able to make innovations directly in the language of Spark especially probably at the RDD level. Okay. Um, all right, so that's the end of last set of notes for last week. So I kind of did a Blackboard talk, so for those of you who uh, maybe missed this, um, and physically were not here, we had technical problems, so I just did a Blackboard um, explanation of this. I'll quickly run through this. So here are some uh, excellent resources from Stanford and UCLA and Berkeley. So what I um, strongly recommend for those who have time and want to get into details of specific algorithms is this 15 hours of expert videos in the R bloggers. Uh, this is by um, um, these two professors at um, Stanford. Um, Trevor Hasty and Rob Tupshvani, they're really clever guys. Um, they're in the statistics departments. Um, so you can get all the lecture slides, you can watch the videos, so every <clears throat> little video is, is, is it's quite good, okay? Um, so knock yourself out. So here's uh, the, um, this, is a, this is another nice book. Um, and then, yeah, so these are some other more uh, theoretically sounder 
slower download. So this one's uh, Elements of Statistical Learning. It's a really good honors level book. Um, I think it's, I don't know if the PDF is still free. Um, ah, yeah, probably in the Russian library it used to be. We changed the URL. Um, so then this is, um, um, you know, a solution manual for it. And then here we have um, Amit's course. Uh, and I already mentioned this book in my first lecture, uh, Kevin Murphy's Probabilistic, uh, Machine Learning a Probabilistic Perspective. So currently, if you want, I mean, I, I sort of have this marked from my vacation. Uh, Andrew makes course in deep learning in Coursera. Is, is, it should be really good. So, um, OK, so this is just a note we can skip. Um, so machine learning introduction, this is essentially a high level. So let's watch this video. Um, it's, it's good four minutes. In this segment, we'll talk about what machine learning is at a high level, providing a definition, describing common examples of machine learning, introducing terminology we'll be using throughout the course, and defining the two learning settings that we'll be studying. So let's start with a definition of machine learning. It's a wide ranging field and can be roughly defined as constructing and studying methods that learn from and make predictions on data. This broad area involves tools and ideas from various domains, including computer science, probability and statistics, optimization, and linear algebra. Common examples of machine learning include face recognition, link prediction, text or document classification, for instance, spam detection, which is a canonical example of machine learning, protein structure prediction, or in other words, trying to predict a protein's 3D structure given its amino acid sequence, and teaching computers to play games, such as backgammon or Jeopardy. Now let's introduce some common terminology we'll, be, terminology we'll be using throughout this course. And to make this more concrete, we'll use the example of spam detection as a, as a running example. So recall that machine learning involves learning from data, and these data points we'll call observations. And observations are items or entities used for learning or evaluation. And in the context of spam detection, emails are our observations. Features are attributes used to represent an observation. Features are typically numeric, and in the context of spam detection, they can be, for instance, the length, the date, or the presence or absence of keywords in emails. Labels are values or categories assigned to observations. And again, in the context of spam detection, these can be an email being, a spam, being defined as spam or not spam. Training and test data sets are the observations that we use to train and evaluate a learning algorithm. Again, for instance, in the context of spam detection, this can be a set of emails along with their labels. The training data set is what we give to a learning algorithm in order to train it. And in contrast, a test data set is something that we withhold at training time and subsequently use to evaluate the algorithm that we, or the, the learning model that we, we devised. Now let's consider the two common learning settings that we'll be focused on during this course. The first setting, called supervised learning, involves learning from labeled observations. The idea here is that the labels teach the algorithm to learn a mapping from observations to labels. In contrast, in unsupervised learning, we're forced to learn solely from unlabeled observations. And here, a learning algorithm must find latent structure in the features alone. And there's two main reasons why we might want to perform unsupervised learning. One is that it can be a goal in and of itself to better understand our data, to discover hidden patterns, or to perform exploratory data analysis. Alternatively, it can be a means to an end. It can be, in some sense, a pre-processing step before we perform a downstream supervised learning test. So what are some common examples of both supervised and unsupervised learning? Well, in the supervised setting, classification is one common task. And the goal here is to assign a category to each item. For instance, spam detection is a common uh, binary classification problem. Here, the categories or the labels that we're trying to predict are discrete. And there's generally no notion of closeness in the multi-class classification set. In contrast, regression is another supervised learning setting where we aim to predict a real value for each item, for instance, trying to predict stock prices. Here, our labels are continuous, and we can, in fact, define closeness when comparing predictions with labels. Now, considering unsupervised learning, clustering is one common uh, unsupervised learning task. The goal here is to partition observations into homogeneous regions, 
for instance, to try to identify communities within large groups in the social network. A second comment on supervised learning task is dimensionality and direction. Here, the goal is to transform an initial feature representation into a more concise one. For instance, trying to find a more concise representation of high dimensional digital images represented initially as pixels. Oh, wow, that's scary. My own video is playing that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, all right, so that is a very nice summary of what I was blabbering. Okay, so. Um, okay, so <coughs> I won't read this for you. Uh, it's a summary of the video. <coughs> I have okay. a question. What yep. did he mean by closeness? Okay, good point. Yeah, so it, he just means it's a metric space. So you can. Okay. So does do do people understand this point? So basically, what what he said was in multi-class classification, where there's more than one label cat, dog, mouse, and so on, uh, there is no prox. You know, there's. It's not that the mouse is next to the cat or whatever, right? There is no uh, metric, no notion of distance in the label space, or necessarily in the in a feature space, yeah, uh, well, definitely in the label space. But in the other one, in regression, so maybe it's some continuous variables. It's usually not okay to assume there is some some uh, notion of closeness. Because typically, why uh, what you're trying to predict will be continuous. So it doesn't change in this tiny instant of time. It doesn't go crazy. So even in financial maths, you assume. Well, at least the mathematical models of finance, you assume that uh, you you know you know just what's happening, everything up to now, what's happening, and maybe just even a little bit more into the future. Um, this is really good. I, I really recommend this video for your own uh, viewing when bored. It's twelve minutes. It's really good because it's good to get perspectives from uh, you know from from. Uh, the sort of computer scientists who do this stuff, and also like sort of more stats guys, statisticians who do this stuff. And this is the Stanford gang. And uh, yeah, they're quite good. So this one, in a typical supervised learning pipeline, um, what we do, so let's, this is good as well, just two minutes. In this segment, we'll review the steps of a typical supervised machine learning pipeline. Recall that machine learning involves learning from data. So of course, the first step of this pipeline involves obtaining our raw data. And this data can come from a variety of sources, including web information, emails, genomic data or other scientific information, images, social data or other graph structures, as well as user ratings or other user feedback. Once we've obtained this raw data, we need to extract features from it. This raw data is typically in an arbitrary input format, and feature extraction crucially allows us to incorporate domain knowledge when representing each of these observations. Additionally, we typically want to represent each of our observations via numeric features. And it's, it's important to note here that the success of a supervised learning pipeline crucially depends on the choice of features. Additionally, there's a connection between feature extraction and unsupervised learning. Super unsupervised learning can be used as a pre-processing step for a downstream supervised task, and this typically involves in, is typically involved in the process of feature extraction. Once we have a good representation for our observations, we're ready to perform supervised learning, and this typically involves training a classification or regression model on a set of labeled training data. Once we have this model, we want to know how, how well it's performing. And how can we do this? Well, the natural thing to do is to see how well it performs on data that wasn't used to train it. And so we can simulate this process by evaluating it on test or holdout data. And this is labeled data that wasn't used for training. Once we perform this evaluation, we can decide whether we're happy with the current model we have. And if we're not, we can iterate. And this typically involves extracting new features and or trying different supervised learning approaches. Finally, when we're happy with, with the, the model that we've uh, generated, we can use it to make predictions on future observations, or in other words, observations that really don't have labels. Okay, so that's um, actually what we will be doing shortly on our own data set soon. Okay, so you, this is quite good as well. Uh, watch it later. 
uh, it's more concrete. It's a spam example from. So of course, you know, this course is right here, right? So if I just open, this is just here, the whole course. So you can do all of this in PySpark if you want. And uh, yeah, so. Okay. So now let's go to 12. Okay, so, so let's do this. So this is our unsupervised clustering example with uh, this one million songs data set. And we'll use the k-means algorithm that I described in the Blackboard earlier. Okay, so, so how many of you know of Kaggle? Okay, so Kaggle is kind of cool. Uh, it's the... So they set up all these competitions, you know, and uh, this was a competition five years ago. Um, set up challenges and um, so some of the best recommend recommender system algorithms are actually done by um, challenges like this. The Netflix announced a challenge to find the best recommendation engines, and so I hang out. Well, I they 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 don't quite have like. Uh, a Spark, they're not quite ready for Spark. The notebooks are limited to um, Python and R right now. But I go there especially for interesting data sets and so on. So this is going to be our pipeline. So we're going to directly do the full pipeline for this example. So the first step will be ETL, extract, transform, load the, uh, the raw data. The second step will be to explore. And then the third step will be to model. And we'll use the Sparks machine learning library for this. And um, for the first two, we'll use uh, Spark SQL. Okay. So the, the subtasks are the following. So we are going to, uh, you know, um, do various transformations to our RDD of the data, uh, or just maybe directly on the data frame itself. And then we'll create a temporary table that we will uh, cache and and do SQL for um, exp exploratory operations. Um, so here's um, um, yeah, here are the three steps. So in in the explore step, we're basically going to use um, you know uh, even Python's ggplot, which is like uh, and, and matplotlib, and we will use that for visualizations and. Um, and take some random samples of this large data because it's some one million songs, so we can't see everything or really read it. So you'll also get exposed to taking random uh, sub-samples of the data without replacement. Um, so, and then finally, we will, maybe we won't have time today, um, let's see how it goes. We can start modeling using the k-means algorithm. And I'll try to describe the k-means algorithm in a bit of a hurry. Right? So, uh, so this is my um, yeah this this is a expected error I think so anyway um, let's do the ETL first so let's make sure well, I I haven't made sure that uh, this exists I hope it does. <laughs> Um, otherwise, we will have to take a detour. Ah, good. So we're on community admission, right? Everyone sees these files. Good. So this is the um, 1 million songs data set. And if you look at the files, there's um, data001, header.txt, and then there are all these parts. So this is a standard way in the Hadoop file system to, uh, yeah, to name files. So it's broken up into chunks and there. So now um, let's look at this header file. There's a file called header, right? So I'm kind of collecting it because I know there's just a couple lines in the file. And what I'm seeing is just what are the column headers, right? There's an artist ID, artist latitude, longitude, location, name, and um, lots of other things, loudness of the song, song hotness, and whatever, song ID and so on. So of course, this is because uh, I know this data set, but you, you, you don't want to collect, remember, you can crash your driver. So 
what I, what I would have done normally is I would take two to see what's there and then count and then, okay, so there's not a lot there, right? So I, I don't, I mean, this is paranoid, uh, uh, a good habit to, you know, before you collect, because I've crashed drivers enough times by collecting massive uh, files or things coming at you, like boom, crash your JVM. Okay. okay. What is the downside to when you crash your driver? Well, well, the cluster has to be restarted probably. Um, yeah. You lose like 10 minutes during this? Uh, I don't know. Sometimes I'm at like the nick of time, like every 30 seconds is like an hour sometimes in life, you know? It's usually at those times this will happen and I go on. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, we should do a play around maybe. Yeah, we should do a play around and see what happens in the community edition when you crash it. <laughs> I haven't done that yet. Because you can just do sc dot parallelize. You can do that. Loop one through a really big number and see what happens. Maybe you can report. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I'll try this. Yeah. Um, so let's see, yeah, so then um, this is just, I'm just taking, you know, the text file, I'm just doing the standard RDD thing, so, right, so I have my uh, RDD, I'm mapping it, and taking a line, and I'm doing a closure, but this closure is a block, right, so inside the closure, I declare a val, uh, an immutable called header element, and that's just taking the line and splitting it by colons, because I know from my header file, it's separated by colons, and then I have header element zero and header element one. So I'm just taking the two parts. Because when I do the dot split, it gives me an array, which is indexed by zero and one. So I'm just um, getting my column names and uh, types. And what I also want to do is define a, a case class. So we've seen case classes already called song. And I'm basically using this the stuff I have, I copy paste pretty much and hand craft a case class, okay? Um, because it's a standard file. So what am I doing? I'm defining it to be song and it has uh, a field called this, artist underscore ID and of type string and so on and so forth. This one's uh, artist latitude is type double and so on. So now I evaluate my case class called song now I create my um, RDD by reading, you see I put a minus star operator, so it's going to read all the parts from the 001 file. So I mean, this is not everything, right? So if I count, this is uh, well, the million songs, it's only 31,369. We want to do this in this community edition quickly. Um, so here I'm just taking three guys and if I look at it, oh, there's another problem with the, um, so, um, sorry, that's not my machine. So, um, so I have like the first array has um, not a number because you know, remember the second element was a double latitude and longitude and, uh, um, and then, you know, so let's, let's, and we, and we kind of hand roll the base classes, right? So let's see what happens um, when we do this sort of dangerous thing. So here, um, what I'm, what I'm, I know my, my lines are separated by paths. So I'm just going to do this naive thing first. I'll take my line. Okay. So I'm, I'm defining a function called parse line. This function returns a song, right? This case class I made. And inside it's creating a immutable called tokens. And then it's taking the line that I pass as input, which is a string, and splits it by tab. And then now tokens is going to be an array of all these little, uh, you know, parts of the of the line um, uh, tab separated. And then I'm just going this really dangerous thing. I'm doing songs is tokens of zero because I'm saying the first column should be, you know, um, first. Um, uh, first element in songs and the second column should be uh, the second element in song and so on. And then I use this method, uh, built-in method to double, okay? Because I want that to be double, remember? Because song <laughs> expects this to be double and so on. So if I evaluate this, that's a well-defined function, parse line, and nothing, you know, um, it's really been done. Now I'm going to do, take my plot RDD, data RDD, 
right? And I'm going to map this parse line function to every uh, ele every element of this RDD, which will be my string, which is line by line strings, right? So, okay. Wow, that's great. Except nothing's happened yet, right? Because we're just doing transformations. Um, and here is my parsed RDD to data frame. So I say, okay, now I'm going to convert this to a data frame using this 2DF method. Now it looks great, um, except everything is lazy, so nothing's, no action has been taken. Um, so, right. So, okay, now we can register this as a temp table. So now we say, okay, everything is sweet, let's do some SQL. So let me cache the table. Oops, so we have an error, right? So the error happens because uh, there is um, essentially uh, problems with, um, <coughs> with, with types, you know? So it's the input string, input was a string called nan. It's actually the two double method for the second column in the first line. It's trying to cast nan, the string nan to double and it can't, right? So that's because we kind of dangerously did this. So here's how like a better data engineering scientist would do. I mean, um, so you do just more cautious try catches, right? This is basic computer science concept. So what you do is instead of just two double, like we did before, now we do two double, um, you know, so we define all these, our own two doubles, which will first try to see if the value that we pass in as a string, uh, can be converted to double. If it can't, then it will throw an exception and use the default value for that type it's trying to convert to, okay? So this is essentially very classic defensive coding, right? So I'm doing the same for two int because I'm only using two double and two int as the, as the methods, right? When I create a song object. So that's exactly what's happening here. Um, I do songs token of zero. Um, and um, so on, two double tokens of one, and so on. No idea. Um, okay, so now um, just evaluated this, and I'm going to try to, um, yeah, just run the next cell. Um, so I have um, data RDD, and I'm converting this to a data frame and I'm creating, so now everything will hopefully work. So I'm caching this table and now actually everything is, actions are done and I have this cached because we've done a, a, a safe way of uh, casting, right? So here's my, so I'm selecting every single column, select star, from songs table and limit to the first uh, 10 rows. So you can see the artist ID has some ID um, and the artist name is Earl 16 mm -hmm. and the song duration is this and um, in the fade in is zero seconds, I guess. Um, loudness and key, key confidence, I don't know, all sorts of features, right? So Spotify has sort of made a business out of this, right? Rec making really good recommendations. So they're Stockholm based. Um, okay, so the title of the song is Rastaman. It's from year 2003. So as you can see, um, that's our essentially um, songs data. Okay, so now let us um, do this, exploring the songs data. Um, so our goal is to predict which songs a user will listen to and then serve that as a recommendation. That's sort of our end goal. So we're now in the exploratory phase. So let's do some, get some insights about the data, All right? So I, um, because I didn't want to create a table view that I want, uh, that I wanted to persist across notebooks, I, I did this, but also, to just make sure that we, um, you know, that we are um, very clear on what parts of the earlier notebook we really need 
to redefine this table, okay, and, and cache it. So all we need is, um, so please fill in comments here. So this is your exercise. It's not going to be graded or anything. So this is my case class to um, represent a row um, of my table in my data frame. Okay, because you really need to comment to or your colleagues will hate you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Parse line. So parse line is uh, my more robust function to um, parse the line um, um, from a string to a song object. Okay, um, whatever, you can put more here, you know, if you want. Okay, um, and it is good to do this, right? Because, because you know, because the problem is sometimes you're like, oh, um, oh, this is obvious, you know, they're idiots, I don't understand. But if you're really honest with yourself and you work hard enough, you yourself won't understand your own code. That's normal. <laughs> Okay, so do it for yourself too, um, especially when you're tired and working, pulling shifts all night or whatever, it's good as well. Um, so okay, okay, this is um, tokens and so on. So all of this, this is all we needed. So if I just uh, reevaluate this, um, I should just get my song stable back uh, in temporary view in this notebook. It's uh, notebook specific. Fuse. You can do uh, a permanent view, but um, okay, table type to be permanent, but let's do it like this for this one. So song stable is there, that's great. Um, so a first inspection. So let's just do this, already done this, um, first 10 rows. Now let's print the schema. Okay, so we know these are Artist ID is string, okay, it's nullable, and, and so on. So now I'm counting from my songs table in SQL. Right? So that's exactly the number we saw, the number of rows. Um, and I can also do this um, like this in data frame using the data frame API instead of SQL. So now I'm simply um, you know, passing the SQL string to SQL context. So just because the table is in temporary view, you can do this. And what I'm seeing is um, um, a, an average aggregation plot, right? So what is, so you look at plot options. So every time you see a plot like this, just pick that. So my keys are years, so that's my x-axis, my keys here. And my values are duration. And my aggregation operator is average, <clears throat> okay? So um, yeah, you just need a line chart. So this kind of thing you want to do quite a lot, especially on data set here you have not seen before. So, I mean, there seems to be some kind of trend here, right? Songs are getting longer. I don't know. I have my own theory is people are smoking a lot of dope and they were like, yeah, yeah. man. Uh, this is not statistically decibel. <laughs> it's the 70s. Yeah, it's the 70s, <laughs> that's what I say. <laughs> I mean, it could be right. It's like war time, and um, so anyway, you you want it. This is this is what you get sort of paid for for your scientific skills. This is what's very 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 important uh, to take your insights, and that's why a lot of successful data scientists are from all over. Um, they're from everywhere: social science, physics, chemistry. You know, it doesn't matter. So it's your sort of innate uh curiosity and blah 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 uh, that helps you explore the data and get a lot of neat, neat insights that you know uh, you can't see without the exploration and then bring those insights back into some algorithm basically okay so now sampling and visualization is very important because if you have a million rows right even in this case like thirty thousand rows you how do you see you know i just do take 10 i'm only seeing the top 10 right I want to see maybe random slices of tens and see what are the other songs and things like this. So for that, um, you know, we, we want to use a take sample method soon. Here is again just a ggplot of this. 
Um, so this is just um, just looking at the actual um, dots here because this is small enough. So I'm just showing you year and duration and just showing you the actual, uh, uh, you know, these pair, pairwise features for each song. Uh, yeah. And, and when the data is really big, like, you know, tens of millions or whatever, where you cannot even put all the dots in the, in the pixel, there are really neat ways of doing this by, by doing random sampling and, or by doing uh, multi-dimensionality, uh, multi-dimensional reduction techniques or dimensionality reduction techniques, which will project the data to a lower dimensional uh, space like SV, singular value decomposition or principal component analysis. You guys have heard of that. Those are standard ways of getting insights into uh, high dimensional data. And if you remember Amit Tawakar's video, he was talking about uh, dimensionality reduction as another common unsupervised learning technique. So have fun. You can try to, you know, if you know uh, ggplot, you can play more with it. Um, yeah, maybe we'll break here for today because uh, I have to run to the seminar. And uh, the next thing I was, uh, we will continue is from this one. And just to give you sort of coming attraction, um, we're going to basically start using the ML pipeline very, very quickly. Um, so we'll use all these notions like vector assemblers and transformers and um, various core components of a machine learning pipeline, estimators, evaluators, uh, and also get into the k-means algorithm a little bit. Um, and I think the next one is um, supervised clustering. So we will do this uh, uh, decision trees. So I'll probably do a little lecture on decision trees and then uh, um, I mean, a sort of, um, a, you know, explanation of what decision trees are, and then we'll get into this uh, hand, handwritten digit uh, classification. Okay. Here is our, now you can see this. This is my list of potential projects. I usually read the ACM communications cover to cover. I haven't done it for the last six months because I was moving from close to Antarctica to close to Arctic. But so these are my best finds for possible applied projects in this course. You can you can look at this. Uh, you know you can hit one of these links. Hopefully they should just work if you're in Uppsala. So these are um, you know ACM Communications is Association for Computing Machinery. It's a professional society. Um, people that are into this type of stuff usually belong to. And the an ACM Communications is a high level thing, right? They are not going into the theorems and the code and stuff. It's uh, easy to read stuff yeah it's just trying to authenticate so there's a lot of stuff here uh, examples in digital humanities sentiment analysis computational epidemiology you know there's a lot of stuff just knock yourself out um, and I'll update this when I find more time so a lot has happened in the last seven months okay so are there any quick questions